It's great to welcome to the program today Tom Standage, who is deputy editor of The Economist and also author of the book A Brief History of Motion, From the Wheel to the Car to What Comes Next. Uh, Tom, it's great to, to have you on today. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me. You know, I've, uh, I'm actually reading right now the book 1491. Right. And uh, one of the interesting anecdotes in it is about how was it that so few Spaniards were able to defeat these these large armies of uh, of Inca and other groups in uh, what is now Central America. And one of the things that's mentioned was the superior uh, understanding and use of the wheel in all of its different forms by by the Spanish. And although I wasn't reading that because I was going to be interviewing you, it, 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 I think the importance of the wheel and ultimately of automobiles, it really cannot be overstated in terms of its impact on human society and culture, can it? Well, I think that's true, but I also think it's very easy to overlook. Um, so, for example, um, someone once said that if you're a fish, right, you're swimming around in water all the time, but fish have no concept of what water is because they're yes. just surrounded by it and they just assume that's... You know, that's the way the world is. Um, and I think we're sort of the same with cars. We we live in a world that has been shaped by cars and we can't imagine it really being any other way. So what I'm trying to do with this book is sort of point out the water to the fish and say, how did we get here and how might things look different? And um, if we are going to be less reliant on cars in the future, and I think we probably are, um, then, you know, it's helpful to see if we're going to start unpicking cars from the fabric of our civilization and from everyday life, um, then it's useful to see how it was woven in. So that's really what I'm what I'm trying to do. Yeah. And in 1491, the other factor we should mention, of course, was disease. I mean, the fact that the, Indeed. Um, the Europeans took all those contagious diseases. I'm sure the, the wheel played a role. The other th interesting thing is that um, American cultures were aware of the wheel, um, but generally didn't use it. Um, it was uh, it was used in some toys. Uh, and this is one of the striking things. You know, the wheel is a, a great cliche uh, about the wheel is it's well, the greatest invention in in history and this sort of thing. Um, but the amazing thing is how many cultures knew about it but didn't use it. Another example would be the Egyptians who managed to build the pyramids entirely without using wheels. Uh, they knew about wheels because the Mesopotamians next door had them. But the, the the Egyptians just found it much easier to move things around on rafts on the Nile and rollers. And in fact, there was no wheeled vehicle on earth that could have taken a, a block <laughs> that you would use to build the pyramid. It was just those pyramid blocks are really, really big and heavy. So, um, so this idea that wheels are the greatest thing Ever is a very recent idea. It's a sort of early 20th century idea. And it's at the point where we are reshaping the world around wheeled vehicles that we decide that actually wheels are totally awesome. Um, but that's a relatively recent way of looking at things. Yeah, I, uh, I think sometimes it's missed by lots of people that in cities, towns, villages, I mean, in, in much of what is when I say the developed world, I don't even mean the West, but just even parts of any country that is what we would consider developed at all. The um, amount of uh, the planning and and surface area that is geared around prioritizing wheeled vehicles over walking and and that unless you think about it, it may not be apparent to many people. No, well, I mean, it, it's it's more of it. I mean, it's obviously most most recognizable in in the U.S., which has these laws about you know if you build a new retail development, you have to have a certain number of car parking spaces right uh, by one estimate there's six spe parking spaces i think for every car in the u.s um so i mean that's a, at about 30 percent of the area of a typical u.s city is parking um so i mean it's it's amazing how much space is is um is given over to vehicles and i think one of the interesting stories um that i really you know found uh was struck by when i was researching the book was the extent to which um you know this this handing over of so much space to the car is a very recent thing. It's only happened in the past hundred years. I mean, even if you look at uh, photographs of streets from say 1910 in Europe and the US, um, you don't see parked cars along the side of the street. Um, and then, and you also see, if you look at film from the early 20th century, uh, there's a very famous film of um, uh, going down San Francisco um, in about, I think it's, you know, first decade in the 20th century, it's just before the big earthquake. And, um, uh, and it's amazing that you've got all these different kinds of vehicles and people in, you know, weaving in and out of each other. Yeah. Um, and in, in the 1920s, yes. you get this big change where the, the car drivers say, well, no, this is slowing us down. Everyone else needs to get out of the way. Roads are for cars. They're definitely not for pedestrians. They're definitely not for horse-drawn vehicles. Frankly, we don't much like streetcars either because they get in the way. 
Um, and so the supremacy of the car really becomes a thing at that point. And, you know, nowadays, you know, if you stand in the middle of the road, you're an idiot. A car's going to hit you. Of course it is. What are you doing there? Um, but that's not the way streets used to work. And again, this is something that we sort of take for granted if we've grown up in a world that's full of cars. Um, but that's not the way things were. And it's you know not the way things have to be. And if you go to some parts of the world, it's not like that. And you do have much more of a sort of, you know, sharing of street space. And similarly, even some Western countries have decided to take back some of that space from cars. We've seen a lot of this in the pandemic, but it was already happening in places like Oslo and Helsinki, where quite a lot of the city centre, you know, spaces, car parking was given given to bike lanes, areas pedestrianised and so on. So I think we're trying to sort of rediscover what a less car centric world would look like. Yeah. And I think one of the there, there's this kind of uh, I don't know if it's a, it's not really a thought experiment. There's this line that's often mentioned about you know, humans don't really know what comes next and what the next advancement would be, because if you asked the horse and buggy people right before cars came to be what they wanted for better transportation, they would say a more reliable or a faster horse and buggy, which which means they missed the possible paradigm shift of cars with that as a kind of framework. When we talk about electric vehicles, when we talk about self-driving, et cetera, do you think that we're even really talking about what the next paradigm shifts will be in wheeled transportation or or is it more likely about well i think i think we're in danger of falling into a historical trap so this book you know it tells the story of wheeled vehicles starting with the first wheels and then looking at you know various attempts to make steam powered vehicles and trains and bicycles and then you get to cars and cars kind of take over um and then i try to look at what's coming next but i start the book and the reason i think this this whole history is worth looking at so much now by comparing the current situation with the situation in the 1890s and in the 1890s it was it was becoming apparent that the dependency that big fast growing cities had on the horse and horse based transport was completely unsustainable so the population of horses in places like london and new york was growing much faster than the population of people and more and more horses per person were needed to move goods and people around and railways made it worse because you have more goods and people coming in and out of cities um, and so the more you have those long distance links the more you need capacity within the city to move people and goods around and so this was becoming you know recognized as a big problem there was more and more horse manure piling up in the street it was a big pollution problem. It was a big health problem. There were lots and lots of traffic jams. It was very, very noisy. Um, there were accidents and so on and so on. And so people were, were they realized this was unsustainable, but they weren't sure what was going to come next. And then the, the automobile is invented at around this time. It's, you know, it's been in the works for actually about, you know, a, a century or longer, depending on how, how you look at it. But um, the, the proponents of the automobile say it's going to solve these problems. You're not going to have horse manure. You're not going to have traffic because taking away the, the horse, they're originally called horseless carriages, will mean that these vehicles take up less space on the street so they can move faster. Um, they're not going to make as much noise because they've got rubber tires. So streets are going to be much quieter and there aren't going to be any accidents because you haven't got horses to kind of kick people or, or, or run away. And um, of course, all of these predictions turn out to be wrong. And uh, we get more traffic and more noise and more accidents. And the pollution is not so visible, but it's still just as problematic in the form of particulates and um, and carbon dioxide. But what's interesting is that the original way that this is portrayed is as horseless carriages. In other words, it's in a negative way. So we take away the, the horse and our problems go away. And now a century later, we've a bit more than a century, we've, we've recognized that um, that our car based um, transport system is also unsustainable for environmental reasons. And again, there's this sort of you know, apparently simple fix, which is fine. We just make everything electric or we make everything driverless. And then, you know, we've kind of fixed it. Um, and I think we the risk is that we fall into the trap of, of like, you know, if we just change that one thing, everything else will stay the same. And the, the, the story of the car shows you that that's not the case, because changing from horse drawn to uh, vehicles to cars um, had all of these unexpected consequences. And I'm sure the same would be true if we tried to just apply one of these fixes. So what I'm really arguing for in this book, what I think is going to happen is that we're going to have less of a monoculture in urban transport. So we had a monoculture based on horse-drawn vehicles, and then we have, in many parts of the world, a monoculture based on, on cars. And I think what we're moving towards in the future is much more of a mixture of modes of transport. So not just buses and, and public transport, but things like bike rent, rental, uh, ride hailing, scooters, 
um, cycle lanes, more walking, I mean, just all of these things. And I call this the internet of motion. And the reason I think this is kind of a much more feasible alternative to, to using cars for everything um, than it used to be is because of the smartphone. And what the smartphone allows you to do is knit together all of these different transport modes. So you can say to your phone, I want to go from here to here. And it will say, well, there's a bus arriving in two minutes at the end of the street. So take that and then get off and then, you know, get onto the I don't know, a, a scooter or, or a, a ride hail or something like that. But you can actually integrate all these forms of transport in ways that you couldn't before we had smartphones. So in that sense, the successor to the car and car based sort of transport culture is the smartphone. But it's mm. because it allows you to combine all these other things. So, yeah, mm. I think the idea that we're just kind of going to go on the way we are now, but with electric motors instead of internal combustion engines, I think is is simplistic. And I think it's wrong. One of the things that I'm curious to get your thoughts on is that both when it comes to automobile travel uh, and air travel, it's sort of been a while since there's been a real paradigm shift in it getting significantly faster. Now, I don't think the most important thing is speed and there's this obsession with speed and efficiency, but I think it's an, it's an interesting topic, which is um, when you consider, you know, OK, vehicles today may have a higher top speed than they had 50 years ago. But due to congestion and due to so many other things, your effective traveling speed in a vehicle is not dramatically yeah. faster so it's than it's when exactly the highways the were first built. That was a big advancement. Highways speed as it was and, in the and, 1890s. And, it's eight miles an hour. So it hasn't changed at all. Right. Right. When it comes to air travel, we had this phase where you had the Concorde supersonic, but it was very expensive and inefficient and loud. And now United Airlines has committed again to supersonic. But basically, you know, planes have basically been going 550 miles an hour for a very long time now. And it seems out of sync with the dramatic advancement in so many other areas, computer processing speed, etc. What do you make of that? Um, I think it's a logistical thing. So the, if you look at the era when, when Concorde was running, so Concorde could basically do um, London to JFK in what? Something like three hours, right? Instead of instead of six or seven. Um, so, but if you actually, if, if you're somewhere in London, so here I live in, in on the other side of London, so East London. Um, so it would take you, so at best it would take me an hour to get to Heathrow Airport and I probably should allow two. Um, and then obviously I have to check in two hours before the flight. Uh, and I've got to go through security and all that kind of stuff. So basically, I have to leave four hours before the plane takes off. Then when I get to JFK, I have to stand in line maybe for a couple of hours to get through immigration. Um, I mean, right. But it has been. I mean, it varies. You know, even if you even if you're flying at the front of the plane, you yeah. get off the plane there. You, you know, if another plane's come in, then there may be a there may be a lot of queue. You may have to wait for your luggage. Then you have to get into Manhattan, which is, again, you find a cab and. Um, uh, I mean, I like I tend not to take a cab <laughs> because it makes me feel ill. So I prefer to take the air train and the subway. But again, that takes you an hour to get to the, you know, to, to the to the um, uh, to Midtown. Um, so so again, you're you're looking at basically a whatever that is, you know, 12, 15 hour process. And Concorde takes kind of four hours off the middle bit. <laughs> but it's right. That's not really affecting the given how much more expensive it is. It's not really affecting the overall um, try door to door travel time that much. And so the number of people who are prepared to pay, you know, that much more money to just take a take three or four hours off the middle of a 12 hour process was not big enough to make it work. And we'll see what happens with this new generation of, um, of supersonic planes. But I mean, the, you know, the I, I mean, you can't fly supersonic over land. And so they're trying to come up with various you know, fixes for that. But um, you know, if there's one route in the world it was going to work on, it would be um, London JFK. And that was the route that, you know, Concorde was was most effective on it. It just it didn't add up. So so yeah, I think the thing to watch out for here, and I don't go into this in the book because it's um it's you know not about wheels and um but it's this idea of um suborbital transport and this is something that uh, Elon Musk has talked about. I mean people have talked about this for ages, but he's actually building a vehicle now that um that may even fly in the next few weeks that we might see doing this. Um and this is where you basically launch a rocket, but instead of going into orbit. Uh, to, so to get it, if you go into orbit, if the space station orbits about once every 90 minutes. So if you get into the lowest possible Earth orbit, um, you're, you're going around the world once every 90 minutes. And another way of looking at that, at that is if you launch yourself into an orbit that doesn't quite 
um, it doesn't quite make it into orbit, so it's just suborbital, and then comes down on the other side of the world, you'll get there, you know, in, in 45 minutes to an hour. So this is the idea that you could fly from pretty much anywhere to anywhere in less than an hour if you took a suborbital trajectory. And the Starship may be able to do that. Then you've got this big problem again if you have to build spaceports outside cities, and Musk is talking about floating spaceports and so on. So that's, that's a, a potential... Um, you know, game changer in terms of, uh, uh, of those things. But I think we're still going to come back to, you know, I like to say, even if we build hyperspace tunnels from, you know, from London to New York, you're still going to have to have security around them. You're still going to have limited capacity and you're still going to have to go to the hyperspace port, which is probably on the other side of town. So then you, <laughs> then you're London to JFK, you know, London to New York, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can take a few hours out of it again, but you're still not getting it down to zero. And until yes. you can have that technology in everyone's homes and you can like step through your... <laughs> your hyperspace port into your holiday home in, in another country then uh, you know i can't see that that can't see that working and we don't even know if this is possible so so yeah i think it's a very good point that actually these boring logistical constraints actually um, end up being the most important factor we've been speaking with the book's author tom standage who's deputy editor of the economist tom really a pleasure speaking with you today i appreciate it thank you thanks for having me <laughs>